I'm going to concede the first question to you because when we were walking before, you asked me something that I loved and it was, uh, what was the first dish that I ate that I can remember? So what was the first dish that you ate that you can remember? I mean, it would have to be Chinese food for sure. I, I have a first memory and then my family has a first memory of me. And I, there's also pictures too. The one that my family tells me is that I, my mom made this platter of like Chinese style ribs. And then I got on the table and then just started eating all of them. And how, like, how old were you? I was like two. Oh, Maybe, you were yeah. cute. You were so cute. young. Yes. And just sitting on the table and they came back and it was just like bones and mouth ajar. Um, but my first memory was probably, I would have to say dumpling making, because that's like such a vivid memory. Like, um, and they would, they brought us into that such at such a young age. It's just like a family communal activity. Um, so yeah, something along dumplings for sure. But I think your first memory with taste is like kind of dictates the rest of your life because mine was always like spice and flavor. So if anything bland, I'm like always known to be that person that asks for hot sauce at the restaurant, like no matter what. Um, so yeah, what about yours? So, well, you don't carry your hot sauce in your bag. I do carry hot sauce in my bag. <laughs> I really do, especially when I travel. I have a little like airplane bag and everyone else has like their like eye masks and like their gua sha and their rose spritz and I have my hot sauce packets. There's some, there's some areas you travel to and it's like, like Europe, I always need to bring my own hot sauce. Yes, because all they have yeah. is a Tabasco. No, they only have a Tabasco. Yeah. And it's like in France, you're like sauce piquant. And they're like, here's Tabasco. Or yeah, in different areas. Yeah. So it depends on where I'm going. But what's your, what's your first memory? <laughs> so my first memory is, and it's like one of those things that it is a memory that's been reinforced by my family. Yeah. Um, but in Jamaica, uh, since we lived near, you know, the beach, we had, or, you know, we just have so much fresh fish. I would, I was two and a half years old. I would require my own whole fish. Like I didn't want it filleted. I wanted to eat a whole fish. And one day I was having my whole fish and I swallowed a bone. And the thing was, I didn't swallow it completely, but it got lodged in my throat. So then I rem I do remember sitting there and saying to myself, or this is my imagination, you know, recounting the story. I cannot let anyone realize that this is happening to me because they won't give, <laughs> give me, me the whole fish, fish anymore. anymore. So I remember sitting there and it was stuck and I had to get it back up and I got it out. But then after that, my aunt who I lived with, she realized this and they told me after that, literally with her hands, she'd be like breaking down the fish and like feeding it oh. to me. And so that was the kind of person she was with everything. But that was the first memory. I do still love a whole fish and I'm so happy in Italy that they serve it oh, wow. wow and they don't yeah wait like how it. old were you then were you requiring your entire fish to yourself two and a half two and a half i was a bit precocious oh my gosh <laughs> i could see like demu two and a half like an entire fish and you're just like <laughs> yeah no that's you're like happened. i'm good <laughs> that's what happened and i you know it's jamaica they'll give you a whole fish yeah i love that you know that's amazing yeah. was food such a love language in your household growing up a huge huge love language and i think across i think across the caribbean it really is for us and i even remember moving here and when I first got here I lived in Nyack New York where my mom still lives and we had like a tight-knit like kind of Caribbean family and I remember learning all the traditions of my Haitian friends mm -hmm. and uh, the traditions of my Costa Rican friends and I remember then I've never been to Haiti but I remember traveling to like Costa Rica for example and searching out the food but then like realizing I was in the wrong region yeah because I had already the, like the specific idea of like what the food was but no like the apps, I feel that good food is so rich and I feel like the experience is so luxurious and I feel like the moments that I shared with my family, extended family, with our village were, you know, often centered around food, but they would be the preparation which would last for hours and it would yes. be chaotic. Yes. And then in addition to that, there would be like, uh, there would always be a party. 
yes. after and they'd be dancing and then you know the the children would be in a room hanging out and then the parents would be socializing and i feel like that really was kind of like the foundation of how i look at entertaining and enjoying myself today you um i love that the food extend to a party because it's like that's the energy that's just yeah. like the continuous energy yeah i mean food was I think it's the ultimate love language, like more than um, like emotional or physical or any of that. Like in in our household and in, in Chinese culture, a lot. Like you don't say "I love you" very much to your family. You don't um, like hugging. May, maybe even considered like too much. Like whenever I hug my grandparents, they're like, "Oh, okay, yes, you're hugging me," <laughs> you know. Um, but you know, they will always make sure like. They're, how they say I love you is like scooping another bowl of rice, making sure there's always fruit like when you come home. Um, I saw this incredible tweet that was like, um, love is when your mom makes a fresh cut platter of fruit whenever you and your friends come home from school. And yeah, it's like when you go, when we go to China and visit relatives, like actually I, I'm like the fullest I ever am because you go to different households and at every household they offer you food and it's their sign of love to be like here's this array and the spread of food and it's your sign to eat it to show your own affection to them so you have to like at least eat a little orange eat a nibble eat this here and there um because that's just like the way we communicate like and we were talking about even how even at a dinner table, like in Western culture, it's considered rude to like slurp or like smack or like make noises with your mouth. But in Eastern culture and like in China, there's so many dishes with like noodles and soup. And it's like the louder you slurp, the more it's like, yeah, it's like a compliment to the chef. It's like, this is delicious. Like, thank you. And it's like, that's so... I mean, whenever I'm in China, all my aunts and uncles are like smacking and slurping. And I'm like, yes, this is... I love it, that's right? That's the norm, yeah. It's like you're not holding yourself back. You're yeah. truly enjoying the, you know, the food that you're eating. In Jamaica, we actually have a saying. And uh, the ultimate like uh, expression of love is, we love you like cook food. Oh. Yeah, that's what we say. I love you like cook food because that's how much we, we pride our cuisine. Yeah, yeah, it's. I feel like it's the biggest. Even to this day, if I make you food, or invite, I invite you over to dinner and we cook together, like that's the ultimate extension of like, okay, I love you, like, or like I want to invest in this relationship. Yeah. Well, thank you for preparing as oh, this no. major, major ramen cabbage salad for me because it is so good. Oh yeah, it's it was so, so simple. Good. I had my own like flavor explosion, like excitement happening to myself over here, and I hope I have not embarrassed anyone with my technique of slurping. <laughs> no, I'm like slurp more, like slurp louder. <laughs> like if I don't hear any slurping, I'm like, does she like it? It's not good. Well, well, if it's not all over my face and I'm not crying yeah. <laughs> and my nose isn't running, yeah, it's not I need happening. A full body That's experience. what happens to me. Yes, good. <laughs> Thank you. And good. I feel like I'm now here you feel alive. Now, and yeah. I feel alive. And I you know this was my breakfast, so I'm ready for the weekend. It's like good. wait, it's Wednesday. What day is it? I don't even know anymore. But I'm ready for the weekend because good. it's Bring me there. Yeah, you know? it should never be passive. Always no, active no, eating. No, no, no. I had it in every part of my body. Every shoes. Yes. Stuff. Amazing. <laughs> so I want to talk to you about your career and the path that you're on. You studied journalism. You worked as a journalist. You also worked as a trend forecaster, which I think is super interesting. And I feel that it also has kind of like prepared you for to being able to see very far ahead. And it's like a mythology that you learn. And um, now you are a celebrated um, media communicator and your focus is climate and uh, social issues. How did this come about? How did you move into the space? And what do you wish to contribute to the conversation uh, for going forward for the future, for future generations? Yeah, I think a lot of it has to do with my upbringing. Um, I've always considered myself a futurist, even when I didn't even realize that term existed. And I still do. Futurist is someone who's inspired by the future, who wants to build a world they want to live in, who's, you know, like bringing in different solutions and ways of thinking um, into this future world. And I think that's actually 
one of the best parts of working in climate sustainability is like always reimagining, having radical imagination, what this future can look like. And now oftentimes it's been stripped away because of the doom and gloom and like, does that future even exist? But that's why I still hold on to it so much because it's like, why wouldn't you dream of a better world in the future you live in? And I think that a lot has to do with, my parents always did that. They always, they grew up during the cultural revolution, the communist revolution, and they always dreamed of um, what would be past that. And um, then they made careers for themselves. Um, they're scientists and mathematicians and, and I always thought I was the black sheep of the family because I was always very creative. And my dad was a neuroscientist and my mom is a biostatistician. And I was like, well, but I'm like, I'm this creative type. And then I realized when I was in trend forecasting and churning there, and then I realized with journalism and how I see the world now, it's like, actually that's been a huge part of everything. Cause I look at things from a science level, from a data level, but I also look at things from a systemic level, a zoomed out level. Um, I look at things like I take both the emotional aspect and the science and I try to fuse that together. Cause I'm very much a human emotional person. And then my upbringing has very been about data. So um, sometimes bringing those together is kind of what helps, but yeah, uh, in terms of social issues and I mean, all everything we're fighting for today, it's all interconnected. And uh, again, I, I think because I'm innately an optimist and a futurist, those are all issues that I, I'm like, yeah, why, why wouldn't we fight for this? And, you know, that means we choose to believe in a world that, you know, these issues would be alleviated. You said something that really struck me. Um, the fact is that if you are a civilian like myself and you are at a place where it is gloom and doom and you don't know where to look and you, you can't escape the sense of, uh, you know, looming catastrophe, um, especially if you wanted to look to sources where um, you could tap into someone who is imaginative, who can reimagine the situation in a way where we could be op uh, optimistic. What would you say to us? Like, how can we be hopeful given the news, the news cycle, which is scary? Like, what should we do to be hopeful? And in doing so, then how can we, you know, reset and contribute to, to getting us to where we need to be? Yeah, well, hope is uh, it's an active choice. And I think you can either have hope or you can have fear. Um, and I think that let's take, because we were just talking about the pandemic, for example, let's take the pandemic is a really great case study on a very uh, centralized time time frame that most humans can understand that we all enter the pandemic with a lot of fear. You know, we did not know the outcome. We didn't, we didn't know the unknown. There was, um, pe people showed their worst sides, like fighting over toilet paper, et cetera, et cetera. And then fear is the lowest emotional human frequency. It's the lowest frequency on, on a human emotional level. And that's actually been studied and, and you can measure the frequency of fear and it's the lowest. And it, but that's also means it's the most accessible. So like anyone from a dog to a child, they understand fear because it's like something you so easily tap into. Um, and so you enter through fear, but then after the pandemic, after months of lockdown, after months of, um, you know, reflecting and we transcended into mutual aid, we transcended into community, we transcended into love, and we transcended into this other level of emotion that was supportive of each other, um, taking care of each other. And I think that's where we are with the climate crisis, even though the climate crisis is on a bigger scale. So it's harder to see that. And whereas the pandemic during lockdown was like a very centralized time frame that we can kind of pin down. So in the climate crisis, it's like everyone entered through fear because it is a scary thing. It's, it's very overwhelming. Um, it's a natural human coping mechanism to delay the climate crisis because like, I just need to live my own life. Like I just need to survive day to day. I just need to feed my kids. I just need to put food on the table. I just need to go to work. I just need to pay my own bills. How can I think about this looming climate crisis? It's too much for me to understand. 
Um, but then once you work through the fear, we can also transcend into the community to mutual aid, the caretaking, and ultimately the acceptance of love. It's like working through the climate crisis is like working through any grief where it's like there's seven stages of emotions you have to go through. And, you know, if, if, if you've ever lost a loved one, everyone knows grief never goes away. You will always grieve and that grieve. And that's the same with the climate crisis. We will always grieve on some extent the world that we live in today. We are in the sixth mass extinction. We're grieving for a world we used to know. We were grieving for many different things, not just a loss of life, but a loss of normalcy or what was even normal though. But we're grieving and then you work towards, you know, at the beginning stages, you'll have shock, you'll have um, denial, you'll have anger, you'll have sadness. Those are all fear-based emotions as well. And then, you know, um, in your grief cycle, then you start coming out on the other end and then becomes into acceptance. That doesn't mean the grief is gone, but you've become acceptance. You have this acceptance of it. And that's what I think collectively as a human psyche, we're navigating with the climate crisis. And yeah, no, we definitely don't, well, civilians like myself, and I'm not going to speak to everyone for everyone, but I definitely, the way I experience it is, you know, I have a son and I think, oh my God, what kind of life is he going to live? And I don't have the input that you've just given me to say that community is going to come together and create a situation where, um, you know, they can sustain what's happening around them. I don't, like, I don't even get that far. I just think, oh my God, what am I doing to him? So thank you for that. I think a lot of times people will say the most impactful thing you could do for the environment is not to have kids, is to commit to not having children. And I mean, I think it's one, quite (laughs) eco-fascist. And then two, to say, oh, how like we're deciding that we're not going to have kids. We're deciding we're going to take away the f- this future from the kids because of our actions. We're deciding that they may not be the ultimate caretakers. I mean, we've already seen with the younger generation how involved yeah. with climate community they are. How reasonable, how yeah. rational. How human, yeah. how emotional, how they prioritize community over wealth and capitalism. And individualistic tendencies. Yes, right. Collectivism over individualism. Yes. There's this beautiful quote from indigenous communities that say that we don't inherit this land from our parents. We borrow it from our children. Oh my God, that's stunning. That's stunning. That's so beautiful. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's like one of those moments where truly I got another piece of the puzzle today and these pieces like really enable me to live the way I want to live and like they're precious pieces because I I, like I was missing this mindset and so like I feel like even with my son now I'll be able to to navigate in a different way you know I was lacking before and then also like with my friends who are grappling with the same questions you know thank you for that a lot of land defenders, they're the ones who have told me like joy is the greatest resistance yes, yes. to the climate movement, the climate crisis, because the climate crisis was created by systems like capitalism that tells you you need to work instead of um, having birthright emotions like joy. Like joy is our birthright. Yes, yes. And we don't need to work in order to have joy. Um, but that's, you know, that's what these systems feed us. And, and yeah, everyone is going to be I believe that everyone's going to be a caretaker, like caretaking on so many levels, not just like a, like a maternal or feminine energy caretaker. It's like we're caretakers of our family. We're caretakers of our land. We're caretakers of each other. We're all stewards of our ecosystem. We're all caretakers of, you know, we're all, that is kind of the group, that mentality that we need to really tap into more and move into. Definitely. You know, and when I was thinking about, um, denying, you know, having a child. And I was just think, just thinking like, you're right. The fact that when these like soul packs are made and like children decide to, to come here and, you know, meet their parents. Yeah. And they choose, choose you as yeah. your mom. Yeah. And like, I was even thinking about the implications of like us as humans deciding that we're not going to have children, like how that's changing 
the universe, you know, on a cosmic level, but that's a different thing. Yeah, that's a whole different, I believe that completely. Yeah, like, and we chose this life. Yeah. So I, I fuse, I mean, sustainability is spirituality. That's a huge Buddhist, Eastern, indigenous concept that has been separated through colonialism and a few different things, but sustainability, like the ultimate sustainability is understanding the spirituality. It's this equilibrium we live with all living things. It's this symbiotic relationship we have. And I wish, I wish a lot of, more of us were able to tap into the message, to meet people who, cause I know, a, you know, I know spiritual people that may even miss that point. Like just the way that, you know, we were chatting before and we were talking about how, you know, there's a, there's a Chinese population in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And I, ha although I haven't studied cuisine there and the influences of cuisine, I, I strongly believe that, you know, a lot of our cuisine is direct, our practice, our traditions, our cuisine and the traditions related to them are strongly, you know, influenced by Chinese culture. And we're talking about the sustainability of the way we eat. And the fact is that we don't waste any food. Like yes. we eat every single part of whatever it is that we're eating. And there's no pretty fruit. Like we're eating everything. Yes. You know, like my grandfather will literally cut away, cut away, cut away until the, the, the fruit is finished. Like there's no you know, there's just none of that. And there oh, never yeah. was in our family. Yes. You know? Yes. And My it, mom eats like watermelon rinds. Like, yeah, yeah. 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 And everything. I mean, and, you know, I live in Italy, so that stands true for Italians as well, because so much of the rinds are used in food, like, you know, in preparation. So I, I wish more people, because it's simple. My point is that it's more simple than one would think. And yeah. And it's very innate, actually. It's just, we've been completely we forgot like where we came from like this like sustainability isn't this radical idea it's actually how humanity has lived for eons before it, the industrial revolution started and you know single-use plastic was only introduced in the 90s so that's like in my lifetime itself yes. um but yeah i feel like sustainability is very innate that was like part of our culture that's how we lived off the land is that we knew we had to use everything because that was like that maybe that was the only time we would be able to hunt or the only time we can gather food and like how else could we extend the life shelf of this i feel like when people say um like you have to be vegan and or you know all of these current quote unquote solutions are actually just solutions for the modern day climate crisis veganism is a solution to mass farming but it's not a solution for the entirety of humanity. Indigenous communities have aren't vegan and they've lived in equilibrium with nature for hundreds of thousands of years. So I think we have to be careful with our words and how we go about talking about that. Cause it's like, are we talking about for now or are we talking about how we've always lived? Is this a solution for the current climate crisis? You know, because even if everyone turned vegan, then that would, and we still had mass farming and it was for corn, starch and different things. Like we would still have, yeah like a good, the climate crisis will still exist. I guess at some level that's depletive of the soil, of the... Yeah, uh, of, our, yes, yeah. our soil is, we have about like 60 years. There's never a perfect blanket solution to the climate crisis. And do you think the flexibility and understanding that and uh, being more flexible in approaching a solution is something that we need more than being so rigid in saying, you know, it, it has to be this way or else, you know, we're going to meet this, the end, the expiration date. Yeah, I think it's one understanding there's so much nuance. Sustainability is a spectrum. There's never going to be that one perfect solution that's like, that's it. Like carbon credits or veganism or zero waste or whatever it is, there, none of that is going to be like, the glorious solution that's going to fix the climate crisis. It's, it's a bit of all of the above and it's a bit nuanced. Like for example, like everyone thinks electrical vehicles, you know, I, of course I believe in renewable energy and EVs and electrical vehicles. That's going to be the next wave of cars and transportation. And then I had a friend who's deep in the space working on this documentary, Jay Begay, tell me that, um, that if we, if everyone in Europe had an electrical vehicle, we would deplete the earth's lithium mm. 
entirely. And destabilize whole areas. Natural resources. Uh, yeah, yeah. And also the global south usually would be tapped into for those natural resources. Yes. And again, receive the most impact from that. So, you know, there are these solutions that exist and it's like, but they're all very nuanced. It's not just like, that's going to be the perfect solution. This is going to be a perfect solution. Now, you know, because I am a civilian. Are, We're all <laughs> civilians. I love that you say that, like, I'm not a civilian. I'm not prepared in, in sustainability <laughs> and climate issue talk. No, um, we can go wherever. <laughs> um, so do you, I, you know, I'm thinking about, because I've had the pleasure of talking to you and learning about your family and learning about your mother and learning about the way she navigates the world and all of her fabulous, um, you know, quirkiness. I call it quirkiness, but remember yes. I'm inducting myself into her fan club. Um, <laughs> Shout out to Jenny Ma. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you think that your experience as a child growing up, do you think that your community experience, do you think that your ancestral experience has prepared you to really accept uh, your lane, your particular lane of climate issue advocate, advocating, do you think it's it's something that, you know, was built into your DNA, built into your psyche because of your past? Yeah, 110%, entirely, wholly, yes. I credit it all to my family, my upbringing, my ancestors, their ideologies. On my dad's side, we have a long line of Buddhists. His great grandfather was this incredible Buddhist leader. My grandfather and grandparents, um, they are Buddhists. We like every summer we would visit them um, between the ages of two and four. I lived in China with my grandparents. The Buddhist ide ideology is very much just living in symbiosis with every living thing. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just so funny because they're very spiritual. And then my dad ended up being you know, a scientist, but he's also very spiritual. Like he uses data, but he's also very spiritual. And I think that's how I approach the climate crisis a lot. And when my parents were immigrants into the US, they were both students in school um, and sustainability was a necessity. Everything that they did in life was just a necessity because they were immigrants. And I think anyone with immigrant parents or have grown up as first, second generation understands that. That, that that was just the norm. I didn't think anything of it. I thought every household grew up like that. As women go in our lives, my mom is a huge inspiration to me because she really uh, is a pragmatic person who was able to work with very little but create a very happy and stable life for us. And I think that she's really blessed because she, you know, she didn't have a lot of information, you know, when I was growing up, but somehow she was always able to find the right resource. Like she just, I don't, I don't know how she would do it. And I would always ask her, like for a while, my mom worked as a coder, like, but this is like pre-coding that we knew, like this is like in the late seventies, eighties, like just to give wow, you, ahead yeah, of the game. just to give you a context of like what, you know, she was doing or, but she, she moved through life because of necessity and problem solving. Mm -hmm. Like, how am I gonna solve this problem? And uh, it just always worked out for her. Like she truly was able to like, really surpass a lot of obstacles because of the, you know, the grace of others and the generosity and the kindness of others. But I, you know, my mom is a very calm, gentle, no, well, She's not very gentle, but she's a calm, generous, caring person. And I think she attracts that back mm. into her life. So she's a very, very splendid woman. And uh, she's, she's awesome. And she's funny. And she's quite a character, you know. She has yeah. soft power. She has soft power. Yeah. Has, but with age, it's gotten kind of spiky. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not joking. I'm not joking. But, but she was all... Okay, look, she's... I would say my mom is not a pushover. She's the sweetest woman ever, but she was never a pushover. And she was not at all ever concerned about ex exerting hard power. Like that wasn't her issue. You had to, to, no, you didn't, you have to drive me there. I'm a little different. Like to get me there, you really have to push me. She could turn it on, but it was sparingly. Like she knew when to use her hard power and she would use it 
to defend herself, to defend my aunt, who is the loud one, the one that's in your face, who would get into the problems. And then my mom would have to, the younger one would have to solve the issues. So she's a problem solver. That's what it is. She's, she's, she's really lovely. Moms are the ultimate problem solvers. Yes. Yes. You know, and you know, this is something else I wanted to ask you about. Can you please explain web three to me <laughs> it's obviously a hot topic and because as women you know we are the foundation of society we are required to really you know sustain and prop up our communities we're required to make ends meet with i don't even <laughs> like, you know, really scant resources, you know, if we're invited to the table when it comes to like finance jobs, we're not usually given a voice when we're there, but I think Web3 is going to change this for us. And can you just give us an idea of how that's going to happen, how it works? <laughs> yeah, of course. I mean, I, I hope so. So again, because I, I am such a futurist. I always look to the future and, and what solutions are happening. Um, and oftentimes new technology is vilified because it's new, it's scary, it's unknown, which I get it. Like the internet, there were headlines all the time of the internet, like thousands of people dropping off. The internet's a scam, the internet, this, like, like no one believed in the internet because it was a new technology at that point. Web three is basically the third iteration of the internet. So web one was all about reading. Web two is read and write like social media. And web three is read, write and own. So when we're web three, everyone has ownership. We will move into an ownership economy. And if you look at what's happening right now in web two, do we have ownership of the platforms? Like you were probably one of the first users of Instagram. You were probably one of the first people to have a lifestyle blog. And did you get any ownership of said platforms? No. In Web3, that would be different. You will have that, the blockchain, everything is decentralized. So you have your own ownership. And instead of, we were talking about this before, instead of making content that will go viral because it satisfies some algorithm. The algorithm doesn't even matter because the algorithm is controlled by, you know, very few specific platforms and engineers, um, which again, all the, mostly those engineers are male. The algorithm leaves and it's like the, the ownership comes to your content will go viral, not because of algorithm, but because of the, the substance of the content itself. And in the ownership economy in Web3, I, I believe that things will go viral more, but on a lesser extent because some a platform's pushing it. If that makes sense. Yes, it makes complete. And I, so I think there's a hunger for that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think there's a hunger, a desire, and also for our mental health. Yeah. Hundred um, percent. Yeah. I I think that you know the the creator economy, the ownership economy, like all of that is going to completely shift. So how women will be involved is that, well, one, I do have to say that the technology of blockchain is decentralized. It was always meant to be built that way. Um, the white paper that Satoshi wrote, it was like with, for Bitcoin, it was all about decentralization. Um, and that's the reason why they use whoever Satoshi was who wrote the white paper for Bitcoin, they decided not to put their name on it. That's a collective. They were a yes, collective. a collective. Okay. They decided to use this like pseudonym Satoshi. Okay. So who Satoshi is, no one knows. Okay. Blockchain itself, the technology is decentralized, but everything else right now in the Web3 space is still mostly centralized. The wealth is centralized. The people involved is very centralized. And again, it's like white males. The wealth is also very centralized in this community. And so, and for us to really tap into a decentralized space, which is what Web3 is supposed to represent, that's the ethos of it, is to infiltrate from within and bring as many different people as we can. Because right now we're building Web3. Web3 right now doesn't technically exist. You might hear it all the time. It's like a buzzword, a trend, word, but Web3 doesn't exist. We're just, we understand the ethos and the foundation of it, but everyone's co-creating it right now. And that's the thing is that it, it's truly a co-creation. It's not like, oh, these centralized platforms of, you know, the Googles and Amazons and Facebooks of the world will dominate it. It's truly meant to be a co-creation, all decentralized. And so 
yeah, the most, I think the most important thing is bring as many people in right now to be like, let's build this new world together. Let's create this future together. Um, let's not be scared of this new technology. Let's, and the more we use technology, the better it gets. The internet had so much energy usage at the beginning. Now we have proof of work, proof of stake, all these mechanisms that it just keeps getting smarter and less energy efficient. And, you know, it's just becoming more and more evolved by the day. And I think as many people as we can to bring in marginalized communities, females, people of color, um, that's super important because it's like a co-creation. It's like if we were getting ingredients for a meal and, you know, right now in the current systems, it would be like we have a finished dish and then they're like, oh, but we need some representation. We need some diversity. And then you add a bunch of just like a bunch of ingredients on top right? of it, but it's not yeah. cooked in. Yeah. And with Web3, it's like we can decide which ingredients are going to actually be like cooked and baked into the dish. As a female entrepreneur, should I, how should I lean into this possibility? Should I be community building with like-minded women and trying to fully grasp what's taking place, what's, you know, what this future could look like? Should, is that how I should lean in right now? Because I also know the power of community here and the power of, you know, kind of just a, uh, word of mouth and the power of having these conversations to understand what our ownership stake could look like, should look like in an environment like this. Because I feel that many of us who kind of arrive afterwards, it's kind of like that, you know, that technological like um, language barrier that we might experience. And I'm speaking, you know, I'm you know, I'm social media and I'm, you know, I'm digital art originator. Like I'm, you know, I'm one would think I would be even more tech savvy, but I'm not, you know, it's always a surprise when I talk to people and I'm like, I can't even read my phone. Like, you know, and they're <laughs> like, what's wrong with you? Or like the fact that I just got a, you know, an Apple 13 X pro whatever, <laughs> you know, and people are always so shocked about me. And I know that like other women in my generation, you know, where, you know, I have friends going crazy about NFTs now, not three years ago. And I have other friends who are like so far ahead. How can I get my community of women to pay attention, to understand the value proposition for us being, you know, ahead intentionally? Well, one, it's to bring them on to the technology in the first place. And yes, it's technology. But if you think about Web3 or the metaverse, everything's interconnected. And the most sophisticated technology in the world is actually nature. So if we can have people understand that Web3 is just an iteration of what we already know. Can we just, can we, <laughs> you're not supposed to cheers with water, but like we just need a snap. Yeah. How perfect is Mother snap. Nature? Well, if you look uh. at all the ecosystems, if you look at the mycelium network and how trees communicate and, you know, different it's ecosystems, forests, how things communicate together, that is the most advanced technology how we know. How perfect are we? Yes. I mean, Mother Nature. Mother, Mother Nature. Yes. And, but we are nature, too. Yeah. It's yes. the perfection. We're not above anything, yeah. but we are nature, yes. Yeah. Um, so I think bringing people on board first um, because they look at technology and they're like, oh, but what is that going to do? And, of course, there's going to be... A whole spectrum of things like the internet now is a whole spectrum of things there's such good happening there's such you know darkness happening um but we choose light we choose light in this web3 space and it's going to happen whether we like it or not and it's going to happen in our lifetimes and to bring in your community of females i would have to say it's a regenerative economy females are always always the last or always left behind when it comes to investments, equity, um, any realm of new advancements in technology. And it's like, no, not the Web3 space. Like everything that Web3 is meant to be in, in its most purest form is what females are already practicing, like community, um, collectivism, um, caretaking, like all of these things where everyone has an equal say, everyone has a seat at the table. This is, this is like, this is ideologies that females very innately practice day in and day out. So I would say bring them in by showing them that it's, it's go beyond the NFTs, go beyond 
the cryptocurrencies? Like, what is this ideology that we believe in? How does it align with our values? And then how can we see that happening? And, and, and it will be slow at first, but I think one of the biggest things, like a regenerative economy, th like those ideologies are things that females have been pushing for for centuries. That's so interesting because, you know, I've had conversations with my friends and what I love about this is that don't get me wrong, we all need to find healthy revenue sources. But I feel like even with the conversation that I've had with friends with NFTs, it's like, oh, you can buy this and you can resell this or the value is going to go up immediately. And I feel like it's driven by that kind of conversation. Whereas this, you know, if I were to explain to a, a you know a, a collective group of friends, I feel like this is more my language, you yeah. know. And like you were saying, we're borrowing the earth from our children. It feels though that kind of foundation for something that's going to be towards, I think, um, you know, the latter part of my <laughs> activity here. It feels very comforting. It yeah. feels very comforting to know that that is something that I can contribute to. And also having been, having been participating from, I would say the early, I think I started in two, I mean, I was using, you know, the internet, um, obviously late nineties, intra, inter. Um, so I've seen a lot of iterations, but it, it will be really remarkable if that is a place that we can head. And I think it's also, will solve a lot of um, the issues that we're experiencing in this current form, like in yeah. just term, across so many levels. Yes, exactly. So many levels. Yes. You know? Yes. Yeah. Every industry will be touched by it. Yeah. And that and that quote was an indigenous community quote. Um, okay. Yeah, that I, yes. Yeah, so. Well, I love it. I mean, yes. we're, gonna, we're I mean, I feel like we're not going to appropriate, but I feel like t-shirts need to be made. I feel like... <laughs> Twitter needs to be blown up. I feel like all oh, these quotes. Temu's no. Cafe needs to have it written on the, yeah. our, our, we have a yeah. quote board and yeah. we will credit because we're all about crediting. Um, I wanted to talk about your work um, with Stop Asian Hate Movement. You're super vocal. Um, I've been fortunate to work with a lot of my friends or be in conversation with a lot of my friends about the movement. And as a mo woman of color, um, I've been trying to pay a lot of attention and to understand how you feel, because it's very similar to how I've felt um, with regards to hate and racism. Um, can you talk about your experience? Can you talk about what drives you in your advocacy? And um, can you talk about some of the energy that we need to, as allies, um, continue to, to contribute to, you know, address the issue that is only, it seems to be only getting worse. We've had like even recent, um, episodes of violence. Can you just speak to that? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, I want to first say that you know, like the racism you experience and the racism I experience, like they're all very personal experiences, but they're all rooted in the same systems of oppression. People are very triggered by this word, but it's, it's white supremacy. And those are the systems that fuel racism in every marginalized community. And so it's the same hate that we experience on, on different, on, in different lived experiences. It's not, Black Lives Matter and then Stop Asian Hate. Like these are the same foundational roots. They're the same systems of oppression that have manifested into our society in different ways. You know, a lot of times these these movements are isolated as one thing and then another, um, but it's it's all interconnected. It's all the same systems oppressing nature are the same systems oppressing marginalized communities. You know, like we're all like you know, my freedom is your freedom, your right to just walk onto a subway or your right to just go home safely is like impacts everyone. Like your safety is my safety. And, and that's like kind of the thing that um, I talk a lot about is like how interconnected all of our fights are and how they're all rooted in the same systems, not to look at an isolated case and and just be like, oh, that person needs to go to jail for life and good, we're done. Because they're the repeating patterns and whether it's mental health or whether it's um, upbringing or social economic backgrounds, they're all the same patterns. And that's, that's when 
we can see very clearly that this is like a very systemic problem. Two years have passed now since uh, the, I would say the, the onset of the latest uh, social justice um, revolution, because that's why I call them, call them the revolve, they come around again. And then the, I think the, the most um, well-known uh, incidents of violence was in Georgia, right? So that's like, we're two years or a year out. Um, we're a year out. You're a year out. So, you know, as with anything else, momentum, momentum fades. And the important thing is that I, I personally, and, and most of my friends, we don't want to walk away and forget, you know, forget the mission that we're on. We're, we're on a mission to bring down the walls of white supremacy. And we can say it here and we can say it loud. It is what it is. It's, it's, it's white supremacy. Uh, I want to continue being an ally. I want to continue to support my Asian friends in every way possible. I want to continue a conversation where absolutely we emphasize that the enemy is one and the same. You yes, know, yes. and the enemy uses the tool to keep us, you know, yes. separated yes. and to feel isolated. Uh, what else can I do? What else can we do together to make sure that, you know, six months from now when we don't see a mask anymore or, you know, we're not thinking about the movement, we're not thinking about the fight or so something hasn't happened in the six month period. So we're not on alert, you know, or we're not. The news is on to something else because that's what always happens. Yes. The news, the news isn't picking it up it's yes, because they're yes. talking about Elon Musk and Twitter. Um, <laughs> what can we do to make sure that, you know, our collective collective fight is still being nurtured and fueled and we're chipping away or breaking down the walls of white supremacy in general. Yes. Well, first off, I just have to say thank you because, you know, when everything started happening with Stop Asian Hate, it was actually my black female friends who are always, always consistently there. Always. They were always the ones checking in, always the ones... Being like, how are you doing? Because they know, they know that lived experience. You know, the Asian American community has to thank the Black American community for the Asian American movement. Asian American, that that phrase in itself was created after the after the Black movement because they Asian Americans want to have a phrase that identified themselves like as a cohort separate of just Asian. They were not just Asian; they were Asian American, and that happened because of the Black American movement. Um, in the 60s. So that's like a, a huge part of how I identify is, is all credited towards the Black American movement and how we can continue working on this and making this not just, you know, a moment, but a movement. You're never going to forget that, you know, you're a Black Jamaican American and I am a Chinese American. Like this is so ingrained and embedded in us. And it's more about checking in um, with each other. The reason why I say this is a lot of my white friends are like, oh, but if I'm checking in, am I reminding you of hardships? And it's like, yeah, but we never forget about our identity. That's not anything that we bypass. Making sure that we continuously speak up about this. I feel like um, a lot of people are quite annoyed that maybe I keep talking about this, even when you know it's not on the news or Asian hate crime hasn't happened recently, but this is this is ongoing. And because everyone has compassion fatigue, it's like, oh, but that movement's over. And it's like, that's the point is that it's never over. It's like, because we're far off. Yeah, we're far, far, far off. Joining forces, because again, our each of our movements are all fighting the same enemy. So joining forces as much as possible in, in all the ways. That's the best that we, that's the only thing. It's not the best. It's like our, the only yeah, thing. Yeah. The only do. thing. The, yeah. You know, we are like, when we say even the words like minority, like majority, like that's completely scientifically inaccurate. Yeah. People of color are majority. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. even just the language we use, the way we present ourselves, the way we align forces, the way we show up, the way we check our own subconscious biases. Um, that internal work is really important for sure. Yeah. You know, um, Anya and I have been talking about creating these illusions. And I think that the one thing that white supremacy is propped up is on this great illusion. And it, it functions on so many levels because 
we buy into it. Like we buy into it even as the oppressed. Yeah. And so I think if we become more mindful and if we become a more unified body, I think that we can escape that illusion. Yeah. You know? It's all smoke and mirrors. It is all. And it has to be to keep us oppressed. Yes. And white supremacy and capitalism are like this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so then we just like are like, oh, I can't fight for this movement because I'm just trying to make ends meet. I'm just working. I'm just this. And it's like, let's shed all of that. Like those are all meant to keep us like just doing instead of like being and being exactly. like, what, what is actually happening? Exactly. Wow. So, and, you know, moving on to, to being, I think that you have a huge respect and a huge, um, I would say appreciation for your being. And I think that you understand how you can maintain the strength because you, your strength, because you are fighting a lot, you're championing a lot of um, battles, you know, with the work that you do. Um, I admire your, the boundaries that you set and how you preserve your being and yourself so that you can give more. Can you just tell us about how you have kind of uh, cultivated your brand of self-preservation? Preservation. <laughs> Um, well, it wasn't always like this. I was very much, uh, just like going through the motions a very like a passive participant in life. And I think you get a lot of signs that that's not working out for you. You get sick a lot. There's signs from the universe. I was on a plane that caught on fire. You know, there's a lot of different signs that happen what? and you're like, okay, things need to change in my life. Right. And that is an ongoing journey, but yeah, very, in my late twenties, I realized like, this isn't the lifestyle that I want to live. This isn't aligned with my values. This isn't aligned with my upbringing. Um, this is, this isn't aligned with my ancestral upbringing and what they've, uh, bestowed upon me. And it's first recognizing when you feel most safe, and when you feel safe and at home, and and I, I mean that in like a more metaphysical sense than like a, I'm in the safety of my own home. It's like a mental and spiritual moment. Um, when you feel safe in your own body, no one can penetrate those boundaries or that bubble. And so then you make, you are proactively saying, okay, I feel safer when I know I'm fully present. That's a huge thing for me is presence. So if I'm at dinner with you, if I'm with you, I'm fully here. I'm not on my phone. I'm not anywhere else. I'm fully here. Um, I know I feel safe when I don't have a lot of notifications happening or people telling me things are urgent because you're like the no disturbed queen. <laughs> yeah. Because you know, someone else's emergency and urgency is in your own urgency and just like to separate that. And I have a friend being who has the best out of office ever. He goes, if this is urgent, please take a deep breath because many things in life are not. <laughs> there's so, there's so little things in life that are. Um, and I love that because it's like, what is actually urgent? Like what is society telling us it's urgent or are we prior to deeming it's urgent. Um, and if it's email, then it's probably not truly urgent <laughs> if it's email. Um, so yeah, a lot of this self-preservation really just had to come with when I feel most at home within my own body. Like I don't feel at my best unless I'm fully present, unless I'm fully rested, unless I can show up in X, Y, Z. Um, and that doesn't mean there's like ebbs and flows where I'm like totally, you know, spinning and then I come back to it. I think it's understanding where your level of homeostasis is and like where can you come back to that level of safety and homeostasis and what does that mean for you and for each person that's very different. And I always thought I was an extrovert because I love socializing and love being with people. And it's still true, I may be an extrovert, but I also very much need to recharge on my own and have a level. And I also view time differently, like time isn't the same for me. And I like to 
ebb, like flow through life instead of being like a rigid, rigid routine. And so whatever that is for you, I think it's like first identifying those levels of safe, safety and homeostasis and then like abiding by it. And th that is that is like your constitution. Like I'm going to abide by Tamu's constitution and rules. As in the constitution? Or not the constitution, <laughs> but like your con That's your own constitution. Yeah. Like we need to figure out, we all need to identify our own constitution or our own... What constitutes us versus a constitution. <laughs> What constitutes your homeostasis? <laughs> Identify and then put into action, I guess. Um, yeah. How do you how do you self-preserve? I don't. Yes, you do. <laughs> um, so um, actually, no. My healer said that I really need to find like a talisman or some kind of symbol that helps me filter because I don't filter. Like she's like, I um, I'm a constant giving, giving, giving. But she says I need to like put down a filter and not do that because I'm also giving a lot and I'm also taking a lot. And mm. um, she said it's like actually kind of problematic. But I. The one thing I know, I think that the mind and the inner being really know and they can step in for you sometimes because I see it happening that a, a part of me that it's, I don't always access takes over sometimes. Mm. And I understand what's going on. Like it's a checking out, but it's not, it's not, um, I'm still, Things are still happening. Work is still ha like going, but I'm kind of checking out and self-preserving. But it's something that I can't control. Like it's something that's happening, but it's it's something else. And I think yeah. it's that part of me that is that steps in every time. Well, it's because we live in an, an attention yeah. economy now, yeah. and so every time you check your phone, you get dopamine, 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 dopamine. And then when you go and do something else, like have a two-hour-long lunch or dinner with your friend, you're like. I'm not getting any immediate dopamine. This yeah. doesn't feel as good. So then we check our phones during when we're sharing a meal, et cetera. But we have prioritized short-term dopamine for like long-term. And that's like truly when joy and play and contentness with life happens. It's like when we like have those long-terms. And, you know, we, we all experience that, that flow. So how can we get back to that level of living. And I think also I was always like a rub bit of a rebel. Like I was never good in school and when, when is your birthday? August 4th. You're a Leo also. That's You're a Leo? Yeah. And my mother is a Leo. My son is a Leo. Oh my God. Leo. Yes, of course. When's yeah. your birthday? July 30th. Oh, oh my God. No so wonder. Like, very makes like my mom. Yes. That's why. Okay. Makes sense. Wait, but are you a rebel? Uh, yeah. Are you like a troublemaker? So I'm a Leo with Virgo. So I am oh, a huge, a bird. I'm, in, I'm like internal conflict all day long. Cause I, yeah, total rebel. And then someone who wants to control. Well, you saw how I want to control. Wait, that's situation. why you work for yourself. Yeah. Cause I, it yes. doesn't work. Okay. Yeah, it makes yeah, sense. Yeah. Instead yeah. of like a corporation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That makes sense. But yeah. I think rebels and troublemakers and people who are like never just like, okay with like living by the system or what society mm -hmm. tells them to do, like needs so self-preservation. So honestly, a lot of the times, like not like doing my own thing was kind of to show myself that I still have that inside of me. Like I dictate my own rules. That's the other thing too that happens, right? You had like that, in that conversation that you have with your inner being, it, well, I feel like it's what keeps you on this, your straight and narrow. Your, your yeah. path. And yeah. oftentimes it's your inner child. Well, that's what I was talk, <laughs> telling you about that other thing kind of like pulling me out. And it's gotten to the point, and I don't know if it's age, and it's gotten to the point that I'm more present than I think. What happens is I physically can't do all the scrolling or I physically can't, but like it just won't it just, happen. It doesn't satisfy you as yeah. much anymore. It yes. doesn't happen and it keeps me there. Yes, okay. because that is the illusion. Once we realize like, oh, wait, this is an illusion. Like yeah. I actually don't enjoy yeah. doing this. This isn't yeah. like, do you ever remember like truly retain a lot of information that you see on these platforms rather than compared to reading a book. When when we once you realize it's illusion, then you can like start yeah. moving forward in other ways. So that that's that's the that's what's pulling me out. And oh. it's like, but the only problem that I have left is and it's been happening for like two years now. The only thing that I have is there is still a guilt that I'm not doing things. 
I can't fully just not do, there's the guilt there yeah, and but there's that's, a little bit of anxiety. Right. I think the guilt is capitalism and the anxiety yeah. is just now normal. If you don't yeah. have anxiety in 2022, it's like, yeah, yeah. I, but, but this yeah. thing is pull, notwithstanding the guilt, it's still pulling me to chill. Like not there's the guilt is there, but I still can't like it just won't, I won't go back the other way. Good, but, good, good. Yeah. Have you read how to do nothing by no. it's by Jenny. That's exactly what I need. Yes. I'll wait. I'll send you the book. Thank you. Give me your address. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I'll send it to Anya. She'll <laughs> yes. give it to yes. you in Milan. All right. I can download it or something. <laughs> no, you need the physical <laughs> book. You need the physical okay. book. All right. All right. Yeah. That, how to well, do I'll nothing. I'll get it today or something. Yes. Okay. I need that. That's the thing. What I'm, I'm having a problem with. Yeah. That, that right there. Yeah. I mean, but, but, you know, but what I know what to do when I don't want to do anything. And you remember what I told you what I do, I binge. Yes. K-drama! Yes. <laughs> we love K-drama yeah. forever. <laughs> we love K-drama. Forever. <laughs> well, forever. Thank you. Forever like this. Forever. Where he's like, yeah. <laughs> Oh my god. Well let's let's finish up. Yes, yes. Yeah, all right. Yes. Yeah. Yum. Yum. Wait, I need to send you a podcast too. It's all about the focus economy. This oh, yeah, please. author. Yes. This please. author t- talks about how right now focus, like in order to focus in our daily lives, it's like asking as if I was pouring itching powder over you all day, and then at the end of the day I told you not to itch yourself. That's the same that we're doing to ourselves by being like having social media and all these things and being like, but don't touch your phone. Oh yeah, no, no, it's, it's, a, it's a drug. It's, it's where, I mean, I, the funny thing is that I grew up um, adamant about not using like controlled, like anything serious. Like if people, you're Jamaican, you smoke weed. No, I didn't smoke weed while I was like even a teenager. Maybe I tried it in college, but I'm not a smoker. Alcohol is a different situation, <laughs> but I have an addictive personality and I know it. And then I think I got into one of the most addictive, like professionals. Oh my God. Ever, right? Which is probably also why you succeeded so much too. True that. Yeah. See, superpower, <laughs> superpower weaknesses. True that. True that. True like that. same, same coin. Yeah. Cause it, I mean, if I, if they, if there was a lifetime statistic of how much, cause they only start to keep the statistic and the phone statistics recently. Right. But if there was a lifetime statistic, I would, would be doomed. Like I would have been on it for like millions and millions. <laughs> minutes yep. well cheers cheers <laughs> i'm like already digging in